You are watching Forbidden Knowledge TV. Hi, I'm sitting here with Billy Carson and we're having an intriguing conversation to say the least. Let me let you in on part of it. So Billy, what are some of the false propaganda messages that mainstream media uses to portray about the black culture in these United States? Well, the mainstream media in the United States has used a lot of propaganda to portray black people in an unfavorable light. The main source of the uh, the main source of the content is the media that's on TV, and I'm talking about things like TV shows, talk shows, and reality shows. Um, primarily, the reality shows have really infiltrated the black community, and it gives a false idea of what real life and what real family life should be like, and what real relationships should be like. And they've actually done a very good job uh, in portraying something that's totally fake, and it has a lot of the youth seeking and going after these types of uh, very estranged relationships where there's uh, a boyfriend and a girlfriend and another side girlfriend and that's almost now becoming the norm. Uh, they're promoting uh, distrust, uh, hatefulness, backbiting, infighting, uh, hatred towards one another, yelling, cursing, and a lot of outlandish behavior. So that's just one of them. Has this been historic and in your opinion is this purposeful? This is definitely historic. If you go back into the slavery days, when slavery was legal, uh, you find that the master over the slaves would typically use these same exact techniques to keep the slaves battling each other, a conquer and divide tactic and technique to keep them battling and fighting each other so that they couldn't unite and fight against the true enemy, which was the master. Billy, did the Catholic Church play a part in slavery? And what I'm getting at is through the indoctrination of Africans. Absolutely. The, the Catholic Church definitely played a very big part in slavery. Uh, first of all, the Catholic Church, Church partly funded some of the ships that came over uh, from Africa to America. Uh, so that right there shows that they backed slavery, number one. Uh, number two, a lot of the people that came here from Europe used uh, the Bible and the Catholic uh, Church as a reason for indoctrinating people into their religion via beatings, via murder, via rape, and everything else. They actually justified it with that book that they're using. They used the Bible to validate slavery. Can you give a couple examples or verses? Uh, well, they used the Bible to val validate slavery uh, by, uh, there's one particular verse where Jesus says, honor your master, uh, your slave master, as you would honor me. And that's a powerful statement to use uh, against a slave. So now all of a sudden you've told a slave that Jesus is God and that he is the creator of everything. Uh, and now you, so you've got the person believing that uh, through the indoctrination. And then now you're saying, look what, it, look what he says. He says to honor me, I'm your slave master, and to actually honor me. So that's pretty strong stuff. I had always read that they took a, a particular verse uh, where Ham was cursed for looking upon his, his father Noah uh, in, in his nakedness and therefore he was cursed and the, the black line came through Ham so they said and so they used that as part of well slavery is justifiable because of this curse. Had you heard something similar? I actually have heard about that as well um, and that also uh, had something to do with homosexuality and a few other aspects which they also kind of put that into the uh, to the black community, uh, into the slavery by actually forcing black males to mate with each other at times. The masters would have the uh, black slaves commit buck fighting to the death, where they would fight each other until one of them died, 
and they would also have them commit homosexual activity with each other. Uh, and this is a way for them again to use conquer and divide tactics to keep them not only weakened but also separated and fighting each other so they wouldn't uh, attack the enemy. And along the way building in a hatred for one another. Absolutely. Uh, uh, an, uh, an unsettled competition yes. uh, among the race. And we still see that to this very current day. Black people are always competing, competing against each other for everything. The best clothes, the best cars, the, uh, you know, the best uh, designed house, the best everything. Uh, never really getting into investing money and looking to spur and open new businesses and things. Mostly just competing against each other for some of the most mundane things. You know, when I was growing up, it's changed quite a bit now, but when I was growing up, they would always have just one. So just, we'd call it the token. Mm -hmm. They might have one black on the channel mm -hmm. or one black on, on the radio station or whatever the case was. Well, I go back far enough where they had a quota when it came to how many blacks could even be on a basketball mm -hmm. team or a football team or a baseball team. Mm -hmm. So it really made that competition and that jealousy uh, even more exaggerated because there, there was a quota. So yeah. I, I certainly understand what you're saying. What ways are black artists in, in music and entertainment used to brainwash the black community? Unfortunately, in mainstream music, a lot of the black artists have really done a detriment to the black community by um, getting with labels that pay them big money and also pay to break them into the industry, millions of dollars in marketing, to get them to talk about sex, drugs, um, you know, cheating on your spouse, calling women derogatory names, talking about theft, talking about murder, killing each other, how they're going to kill you, how I'm going to, how, you know, how their boys are going to kill you and, all, and so forth. So, so they've really done a very bad thing and what's happened is this has all been funded by the big labels. So the big labels, which are primarily owned by um, not black people, <laughs> are funding this type of psychological warfare into the uh, black communities. And that's more or less uh, the the assembly order. In other words, uh, the funder is basically saying to an artist, we'll fund you, but this is what we want. Th this is what sells. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if they want to do something else, it's not going to be funded. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the lane that you're going down. That's very accurate. And what's happened is a lot of artists want to put out different types of music, but when they sign with the big label, they lose their creativity. So the label forces them to put out what they want and some of the songs that the artists really would like to put out, they've been uh, shelved. You know, this has been going on so long. I remember many years ago, uh, Sidney Poitier and Bill Cosby were doing some pictures, I believe it was with Columbia, and they had some big hits, uh, Let's Do It Again, uh, um, A Piece of the Action, and, and mm -hmm. one, one other big hit. So they had delivered three major hits in a row, mm -hmm. and the great Sidney Poitier went back to that same movie company saying, okay, well, I've delivered three hits. These basically were action comedies. I mm. want to do a love story. Mm. And after delivering three mega hits, that studio told him no. And the reason being was, we don't believe a black love story would sell. Mm. So I, I understand exactly <laughs> the lane that you're going down here. Right. Billy, with our great enthusiasm for media and sports, in your opinion, are we being psychologically lulled to sleep? I believe so. I mean, sports is a great thing, don't get me wrong. I mean, I was a coach for many years, uh, AAU, Team USA, um, and I know the power of training and teaching kids how, how sports work and how they can, it can affect them in their real life, how they can apply those same tactics and techniques of hard work and dedication. But at the same time, on the big scale, on the professional scale, and even on the collegiate scale, a lot of it has turned into a Roman circus show. Uh, you know, give them bread and circuses, you know, what they used to say in Rome, the, the, the emperors would say that, to keep the people quiet and keep them lulled, uh, keep them distracted, in other words. So now it's turned into such a big propaganda show with all the marketing, with all the, you know, four and five million dollar commercials that come on and all the propaganda and all the, the sporting equipment and gear that gets sold around the, 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 uh, the, the sporting event, as well as the way that they promote the event and have people come out to it. It's turned into a Roman circus, in my personal opinion. And uh, it's kind of gotten away from where it truly started. And unfortunately, it has distracted multi-millions of people because we have so much 
so many things going on detrimental to uh, the black community right now where those same people that were all raced to go to a game and stand in line for tickets and everything else and show up at the game, scream their heart out, won't even stand up for their own community to make change in their community. So they'd rather go to a game than go to uh, some type of a community event to help make change where they, where they live. Amusement, uh, the Greek word mus, mm -hmm. the root means to lull, to lull one asleep. Mm -hmm. In other words, so that you're mentally asleep. In other words, you're not really thinking, you're not paying attention. And it seems that a great majority of our people are in that state of mind, just not really thinking about the big picture, but lulled to sleep with the entertainment and the sports and, and so many other things that take one's attention, but keep you from really focusing in on what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I'll, I'll parlay this into the next question. The politics of it all, mm -hmm. the Democrats, the Republicans, politics in general, are we being played? We're being played in a major way. I like to call it politics. Um, we've literally been uh, completely destroyed by this complete illusion that they've put up, Democrat, Republican, left wing, right wing, all parts of the same bird. And no matter which line you go down to vote, you're going into the same chamber where they're just looking to cut your head off. You know, it's a slaughter chamber. Uh, and people are really believing that there's a difference between Democrats and, and Republicans, but that's just an illusion. The only thing that does exist are elitist oligarchs that basically take men from around the world and torture them. I'm talking about all leaders around the world, politics globally. It's all the same tactic. The tactic is to conquer and divide, get people to believe that there's two separate sides that they can fight against. Meanwhile, the elites at the very top don't really care what side you're on. They still control all the chess you know, moves from the top. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's really hurt the black community in a very major way because a lot of us have been so uh, triggered into wanting to be a part of it because of being able to now vote and so forth and so on and getting in there. But if you look historically, there's been no real major change. And that's just a fact. All right. So going down that road, let's go back to the Godfather for a moment where some of uh, his lieutenants wanted to start selling drugs because there was big money in drugs. And uh, he said, no, no, you know, that's bad, that's bad. Well, okay, there's big money in it. <laughs> Give it to the darkies, they're animals anyway. Mm -hmm. And that was really showing a, a true piece of history. You know a lot about what was going on in the Iran uh, selling drugs for gun situation. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, you know, what they've done is, again, unfortunately, the country we live in is in part one of the largest terrorist organizations in the world. I hope that doesn't offend anybody, but we've, uh, we've done so many things in, in that situation. We've taken arms and traded them for drugs. Um, we protected uh, major drug lords and drug dealers. We even trafficked drugs back into the country using military planes and CIA planes, um, and uh, we've utilized the soldiers in the field to do that, primarily minorities. So we've got them to traffic drugs out of, into the country in exchange for weapons, and then what we do is we protect, or we meaning the government, protect the major kingpins, but then when the kingpins break the drugs down to the regionals and the street dealers, only a few regionals would get uh, taken down every now and then, uh, but they, never the people really at the top. Never the people really at the top. Never. They protect those people. The street dealers get busted. They get put into this prison cycle, which they then get funded and paid for people going into that private prison system. So there's this double dipping that's going on with this cycle that they've put in place. Um, and um, unfortunately, that's one of the main reasons for the opioid addiction and heroin addiction in America. We've uh, basically drugged our own people. I go back far enough to remember once upon a time Compton was a beautiful neighborhood. Uh, it was uh, safe to walk down the streets and so on and so forth. And Compton is just an example. Compton, for those watching, is in Los Angeles. But that's just an example of other uh, cities, major cities all around the country. They were nice places once upon a time. And then came, purposefully, mm -hmm. the infiltration of, of drugs. I remember talking with Ricky Ross uh, because he was used, as you were talking about, from the higher-ups to 
be given uh, a quota and so on and so forth mm -hmm. of X amount of drugs. But uh, he and his group were the first to hit that area with, with crack. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this, uh, go into even more detail about how our military, how those high up purposely infiltrated the black neighborhoods across this country. Yeah, they purposefully infiltrated the black neighborhoods throughout the country with drugs in order to take them down. What started happening was uh, in the 60s uh, and 50s, late 50s going into the 60s, a lot of these black communities were actually on the rise. Uh, they were becoming prosperous. People were starting their own businesses. Um, they were becoming very independent and that shook up the status quo. They couldn't have that happening. So they began to infiltrate with drugs and alcohol uh, and that was the way that they were able to keep the communities down. Also economic restrictions were put into place so that people couldn't get loans um, and all of a sudden you've got people now who are losing the businesses, everybody's getting high, everybody's on alcohol, uh, there's, there's hardly any jobs and now all the infighting is starting over again uh, and you can see those basic communities start to collapse and that's exactly what they wanted to happen. Is it true that the U.S. military actually guards the poppy fields so that they maintain and flourish? Absolutely true. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for the opioid, opioid addiction in America is the fact that we went to Afghanistan and realized how many resources they had. One of the resources that they had were these poppy fields. And since that time, America had become the number one seller of opium in the world. I think the total that they're making a year is over $23 billion a year on poppy. And a lot of that ends up in the United States, partly as heroin and partly as opioids through that doctors through Big Pharma. So they're splitting it up in, in several ways. All right, so getting back to the politics of it all and working toward disclosure, who's really at the top? Who's at the top? What are they doing? What's their end game? At the very, very top of this pyramid, because it is a pyramid structure, you're looking at the Rothschild and Rockefellers. So you're looking at an organization at the top, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, which again with the Rothschilds are primarily controlling everything going on in the world. <clears throat> you, we're talking about everything from economics to pharmaceuticals to military. They really have, and even space, they really control every aspect of what's going on on this planet. Now for the, for the benefit of, of our listening audience, is this uh, the ruling families that people hear about? Is it the Illuminati? Is it the cabal? Whatever words we want to use. Is that what you're... Uh, There's a lot to? of secret societies that have uh, fractured off of ancient you know, documents. This particular um, uh, family uh, is the ruling bloodline. And if you go back into the ancient Sumerian tablets, <clears throat> you discover that um, there was a, a, a god king named Amun-Ra. And Amun-Ra uh, was in this battle, this final pyramid war that they were having. And according to the records, he decided to flee. But before he fled, he left the kingship and rulership over to his Ra Kam. And Ra Kam, Kam translates modern day terms into shield. So he left the, the kingship, the money, and the wealth of the kingdom to the Ra shields. So this goes back thousands of years uh, when they took over. And were they Caucasian back then? Actually, not really. What happened was, after Alexander the Great took over uh, Egypt, then the pharaohs and the pharaonic era was over. A lot of these former pharaohs and people started migrating, this bloodline started migrating across Arabia and then up into England. Across the time and, and, and place, they made it with other people, eventually becoming uh, Caucasian. This is why when you look into the kingship in England, um, you start to realize that uh, they have a lot of motif, of Egyptian motif. You start to realize that they, the building structures, are also uh, reminiscent of a lot of Egyptian motif and, and design. Uh, the staffs, the hats, everything, even into the papacy as well, is all replicated from ancient Kemetic and ancient Egyptian um, motif and design. Uh, and the reason why is because it all streamlines back from there. And when you really take a look at it, you discover that there's a bloodline that has run from uh, Iraq through Kem, which then became Egypt, up through Arabia, up into England. All right, now, going along with that thread, Nas uh, wrote a song, I believe it was called I Can, and he talks about we were kings and queens, talking about the black race. Mm -hmm. What's your perspective on that? 
when you look into some of the ancient texts, you discover that there were a lot of black kings and queens in the Pharaonic era, uh, going back into the very beginning uh, stages. Um, and this is when kingship was handed over from the Sumerian kings list to the people over in the land of Kem, before it was actually called Egypt. And the depictions of them in their true color is available. Anybody who goes to the Cairo Museum, which I went there, you even see the mummies are African American and you see a lot of African American statues there with their true color depicted on them. Over time though, you have to realize that it wasn't all black people the whole time. Uh, other people came in and took over, Arabs and even then eventually even uh, people from Greece and Rome. So. Over time, and I've been to Egypt twice now, so I understand exactly what I'm talking about. I've seen the hieroglyphs, I've seen the writings, I've been there in person, touched the stones and everything else. The history is, is very clear. The glyphs are very clear in what they say. Uh, it wasn't just always black people ruling Egypt. I mean, it would be a nice thing to know, but it, it's not true. Now, also, we were kings and queens. You gotta remember, there's only one pharaoh and one queen at a time. So, yes, uh, there were kings and queens that were black. That's a fact. The rest of the people were politicians and workers and even some slaves as well. I've got a cousin and he's over in Egypt right now studying uh, Egyptian history. And I, I talked to him somewhat about, well, you know, th there's another whole uh, lane to go down and that is, were the pyramids, the Sphinx, uh, all this great knowledge, was it really done by blacks? or did they have some help from up there? Mm -hmm. Now, he, he got very offended by that. Mm -hmm. and he said, you know, that's just society's way of saying mm -hmm. that blacks were not capable of doing these right. things. And yet, when you really look at it from an objective point of view, once upon a time, there was great knowledge there. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like that knowledge left. Because when you go back, and I've been to Egypt three, four times, mm -hmm. I've visited the pyramids and the Sphinx and so on and so forth. And there are certain things that can't be duplicated even now, as far as mummification, mm -hmm. the dye that they use and so on and so forth. There is some great knowledge there. And yet, when you go down the streets today, you'll have cars, but you'll still have on that same road a horse and buggy mm -hmm. and people on a camel and a, a donkey pulling a yeah. cart and so on and so forth. <laughs> Obviously, the knowledge left. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of what took place back then? My opinion is that some really advanced beings inhabited this planet at one point in time. Where exactly they came from may be in question, but these people are well documented. If you go to the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, their names are on stone tablets etched into stone from over 10,000 years ago. The amount of time that they ruled over this planet in the antediluvial period is without question on there. Some ruling for 10, 15, 20, 30,000 years uh, and this is pre-flood, so after the flood they gave some of the kingship over to humans to be the liaison between them and the rest of the population. Alright, so Billy, let's go back because you know this subject so well, you can just rattle it off. <laughs> but for those that are listening, they're saying, wait, 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 uh, let's go back. What museum did you go to? The Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England. Okay, and they had a list of? The Sumerian kings, antediluvial kings. Okay, and you said Roth, what'd you say? Uh, you, you named somebody that had, had been there. Oh, Thoth. Okay. Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, -H, Thoth. Okay, so, and so you said there's X amount of names on that have been listed. Yes. And some of them ruled for 14,000 years, mm -hmm. some 2,000 years. So that, so you're saying that there were beings that lived that long? They lived that long. Okay. They had the technology to live that long. Okay, they had the technology to live that long and obviously these weren't regular human beings. No. So we're talking about extraterrestrials. In my personal opinion, we're talking about extraterrestrials and that may offend some people, but you have to realize we look like them and they look like us. So what we're really talking about is probably a distant cousin uh, that was able to travel from another planet. We have to realize that the Earth itself is fairly new on geological timescales. And there's other planets that have been developing for multi-millions of years longer than the Earth was. And that people uh, could have came from there to here, uh, which most likely, after you read the Enuma Elish and the, uh, the Epic of Atraasis, you discover that these ancient tablets talk about people coming here from another planet to mine this planet for resources, and then uh, engaging mankind at some point with uh, genetic modification and, and slavery. All right, and so these other beings worked with these black kings and pharaohs and so on and so forth. 
Absolutely. When you read the Animal Tablets of Thoth, for example, the opening uh, verses talk about the great flood receding, mountains coming back up out of the water, temples coming back up out of the water, there was a massive mud plain, uh, and Thoth is told by his dad uh, to go to the land of the hairy barbarians, which was in the land of Kem, and help raise them back to a high level of civilization because they had fallen from this geological catastrophe. So Thoth actually gets in a ship and he flies up into the sky. It doesn't say that, now this is 36,000 year old text. It doesn't say that he got on a boat and sailed out. It says that the ship went up into the sky until Earth disappeared, until the planet disappeared, and then it descended on the land of the hairy barbarians. Next thing is, they land, they open the door of this ship, the barbarians come to attack them, out of fear, I'm sure, and Thoth raises his staff and sends out a ray of vibration at these people, freezing them still in their, in their tracks. So now we have evidence of some type of a stun weapon or, or, or a gun weapon that has the ability to freeze people, which we do have now in modern times. Uh, and then the next thing he does is he releases them and starts to talk about raising them to a high level, level of civilization and also talk about peace. You said, okay, and we do have this now in modern times. It really sounds like we're catching up to some things, finally, that used to be a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We typically right now are rediscovering everything. Nothing invented is new. We literally are only rediscovering everything that already existed. The metric system isn't new. Uh, the, um, the Grand Gallery of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, the, the latitude, uh, uh, longitude, I'm sorry, is the exact numbers of the speed of light in meters per second. Well, if you go into some of the ancient Sumerian tablets, you discover that they were already had a metric system of uh, pre-Sumerian. So what happened here? We rediscovered the metric system. It's not brand new. All the technologies we have now have already been discovered. You go to the Temple of Abydos in Egypt, you look up in the ceiling about uh, 60 meters up, what do you see up there? Helicopters, boats, tanks, airplanes, saucers, saucers, in the, and everywhere you go, everywhere I went in Egypt, I saw technology etched into glyphs. This is real stuff. Jet pillars that look like Tesla coils, wireless light bulbs. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. They even had a movie theater there, and the stellas that would uh, emit vocals and sounds to the pharaohs were made of crystal. Or well, what do you use with quartz crystal? You can make a radio with that. Tesla proved that in the 1800s. You talked about the bloodline a couple minutes ago. We have heard that every president, or just about every president of the United States, is somehow related to a bloodline. Let's talk about that for a moment. Absolutely. Going back again to the King's List and the Ashmole Museum, you find that these, uh, these uh, beings made it then with humans. This is actually talked about in the book of Genesis. Uh, and then these, these humans were then the pharaohs, the, the offspring were pharaohs. So that bloodline stayed there, uh, and then eventually when the pharaohs were ousted and started to migrate across Arabia, uh, that bloodline goes all the way up into England, and it turned into what they call the Plagenet bloodline. Let me interrupt for just a second, because when we talk about the bloodline, uh, we can go into like King Louis the Fourteenth or mm -hmm. Henry the Eighth or whatever, and they are always said they had a right to rule by divine destiny because of the bloodline. Yes. So they were, even though it seemed by then the bloodline was really quite corrupted and quite diluted, but they're really going back to what you're talking about now from yes. the earliest of days. Mm -hmm. You're saying that it was these other beings, call them extraterrestrials or whatever the, uh, one would want to term them. Mm -hmm made it with these humans. Yeah. These humans, of course, were extraordinary because of the bloodline that they had. Mm -hmm. They were put in place. These were the early pharaohs you're speaking yes. of. And so therefore, they did have some supernatural power, some supernatural ability, mm -hmm. even a supernatural intellect mm -hmm. because of the bloodline they had. And that's where the kings and queens kept uh, just downloading, downloading, and saying right. we have a right to do this because yes. of divine destiny. Absolutely, you're correct, 100%. So when you get to John Lackman at the top of this Plagenet bloodline and follow his bloodline on the mother's side, you discover that every president of the United States, except for Van Buren, who is still related to royalty, uh, are all related, they're all cousins, Sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth cousins of each other. And they're openly admitted this now as well. This is not anything that's a mystery anymore. Even the presidents themselves have openly admitted it. Even some of the people that work with the presidents, like Dick Cheney, 
you know, he's a cousin of Obama. Obama came forward on national TV and said, yes, he's my cousin, and so did Dick Cheney, and so did Dick Cheney's wife. She wrote about it in the book. Uh, they're all related. It's a big family. Uh, and what people don't realize, because they usually tr trace back through the father's side, never the mother's side. It's a very interesting thing. So uh, let's talk about this for a moment. So you're saying that um, Bill Clinton, Obama, others, even when they were young, someone said to them, well, you have a special bloodline, therefore you could possibly be in the running to be a president of the United States. Absolutely correct. Uh, these people are told at a very early age, usually in their teens or late teens, sometimes in their young 20s, that um, they're in the bloodline and they could be a potential presidential candidate, and they start getting groomed from back then. If you look at the presidents, you notice how they're all groomed to be put in the position that they're in. And um, even Trump uh, admittedly is the cousin of Hillary Clinton, who's also a cousin of Bill Clinton. And Trump, if you trace his bloodline back, where does it go? Back to John Lackland. All right, now, for some people listening, saying, wait a minute, this is way too much. This is far, too far. This is hogwash. <laughs> Leon, why are you even presenting an interview like this? Give me some specifics of, of some proof. You, you, you said someone wrote a book. Give me some more specifics here. There's a junior high school girl that actually did a science project, and her project was to uh, find the genealogy of all the presidents. Well, little to her disbelief, she found out that all the presidents were related. So this is a girl in junior high school that had discovered this, and it made international news. Once that made international news, that's when it was then presented to Obama, uh, presented to Dick Cheney, presented to others, and they all came forward and said, oh yeah, this is actually true. And then NBC and Fox News also did their own special on it and their own investigation on it through Jenny.com and discovered that this was actually true. And anybody can do the research. It's not anything that's mystical or hard to find. It's public knowledge now. All right. So for those of you that are uh, still in disbelief, you can go online and look this up yes. and, and come to your own conclusion. So Billy, we're going to revisit, did the Catholic Church play a part in slavery through the indoctrination of Africans? I, I want you to pick up on that a little more. OK. The Catholic Church. Um, was heavily involved in the indoctrination of African Americans and also the murder of them as well. Uh, if you take a look into history, you discover the Papal Inquisition. And the Papal Inquisition lasted for about 700 years, and during that time, they killed and tortured 80 million people. Uh, this is under the order of the Pope, under the, under the papacy from the Catholic Church. The majority of the people that were tortured were, of course, indigenous people, which were mostly African American people, and killed for not wanting to convert over to that system. So if you went against the system, fought against the system, or didn't convert immediately into the Catholic system, you were, you were killed. A lot of these soldiers that would come over uh, on the ships to indoctrinate the people at that time, uh, we're talking, we're going back hundreds of years now, mm -hmm. we use murder, rape, uh, imprisonment, torture tactics, and a lot of these torture mechanisms are actually available. You can look them up online to see what they use. Mm -hmm. They would uh, insert uh, something called the Pope's Spear into women's vaginas, and then it would expand and, and cause obviously great pain and discomfort and sometimes kill them. Uh, they would put these pyramid-type objects under the buttocks of the men, and they would raise them up and down with ropes onto this device thousands of times. And these were all methods used to get them to convert? Correct. And, and to leave their own culture and convert. Exactly, because so. it would be done publicly so everybody can witness the torture mm -hmm. and then you know, you're like, Look, I don't want to go through that kind of torture. But isn't that um, a paradox? In other words, they're teaching about a loving God, but they're torturing people to convert yes. to join the family of this loving God. Exactly. That's the tactic and technique that they used. So they realized that the first generation they would convert would be from fear of being tortured and murdered. By the second and third generation, they would be then taught by the parent that this is the way to go, and they wouldn't have to torture and murder anymore. So this is a Holocaust in its own right that's never truly been talked about, is, is that correct? This is a massive Holocaust. Uh, over many hundreds of years, they literally killed and tortured 80 million people. And this was not done to just those of African descent. Also, it took place in, all throughout South America, correct? Yes. Over time, I've taken a lot of trips to South America. I've been down in the Yucatan Peninsula, to Tulum, uh, to Peru, Lima, Cusco, Sacred Valley. 
And what I discovered there was the same exact tactics and techniques that were used on African Americans for conversion into uh, Christianity through the Catholicism was the same techniques they used down there. Torture, rape, a lot of the indigenous uh, guides that I would use to hike through the jungles that were still a part of their own natural spirituality and didn't want to convert their families never converted over to uh, into the, you know, the Christian society through Catholics um, and how they avoided it was hiding in the mountains and hiding in the jungles uh, but they never converted but they are very upset at how their people were tortured and traumatized into uh, that religion now we had a conversation earlier uh, it was off camera but you were talking about from slavery days and even pre-existing slavery days the things that happened to this black culture it's still within their DNA can you expound on that oh absolutely uh, one thing people have to understand about DNA is now it's been scientifically proven that DNA stores information not only stores information it stores memories as well this is peer-reviewed science one gram of DNA can store 700 terabytes of data I'm talking about digital bits of information scientists have taken information and download it onto DNA and uploaded it back from DNA onto a server. So it's been scientifically proven. Now they've also found that DNA can send and receive wireless information as well, like a Wi-Fi signal. This is amazing stuff. So one person's body can store all the information from the beginning of time. That's how powerful the storage mechanism is on DNA. So now, fast forward into slavery, you have slaves being tortured, beaten, taken away from their uh, homeland, uh, you know, converted into this uh, new system uh, and now all that information is being stored in their DNA and then they're having babies and passing it on. They're passing on this genetic information over and over again. So when somebody is an African American and say that, uh, you know, slavery still affects me and then people kind of try to scoff at that, you can't scoff at that because slavery is really still affecting that person even in today's society, 2018, Slavery that torture that happened 400 years ago will directly affect a person from the black community till this very day. Would you say that that stored DNA and, and the way that we as a culture were taught to hate ourselves, mm -hmm. hate one another, the whole divide and conquer mechanism, mm -hmm. is that one of the reasons in your opinion that the black culture still hates on itself? Uh, for example, there's more black on black crime mm -hmm. than any other crime. Uh, more young black men have killed other black men than all the uh, blacks that were lynched mm -hmm. in the history of the United States. Are you saying that that has something to do with it? Th this uh, hatred, this warring, this mm -hmm. rivalry, this we can't get along, we can't work as a culture together? Talk about that a moment. It's literally been bred into us. You know, if you take horses, you can breed them to get a specific uh, type of a racing horse or a stud horse you can breed dogs, you can breed human beings as well. Uh, masters, slave masters knew this, that's why they would breed the, the strongest men with the strongest women to get the strongest offspring. Uh, so this, this torture that has been bred into us genetically, along with breeding the strongest of the strongest to create this stronger offspring, is a couple of things happened from that. One, we created super athletes on the planet, I mean there's no question that black people dominate the majority of sports, but it's because of this inbreeding and this mating system that was set up, as well as the fact that um, this uh, genetic uh, disposition to hating each other, want to fight and battle each other, to be jealous uh, of each other all the time, and to not want to help one another out, was also bred into us as well. So when you have this beaten into you, and then you made it and made it and made it over and over again, you create this entire civilization or society that has been taught to hate each other. All right, so let's stop it there for a second because I'm the type of individual I, I so much dislike excuses to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not my fault because. Uh, I couldn't make it because. So how do we break this cycle? Right here, right now, how do we start breaking this cycle? The first thing we have to do to break this cycle is we have to uh, get African Americans to drop the religious system which is going to be very hard to do because it's literally been beaten into us. And when I say that, I'm not saying that they have to say God is not real because I don't believe that. I believe God is real. There is a creator of this universe. Quantum physics proves that. What we have to do is, I'm saying, we have to get out of this religious system, this system that is a man-made system designed for control 
of you ment of you mentally mental mental enslavement basically. We have to get blacks to understand spirituality, how to directly connect to source, how to take a journey into inner space for salvation versus looking for salvation externally. And we also have to educate them on the truth about the Bible and a lot of these other holy texts, what their sources are, where they come from, where does it, where, when was this information written, what's the original text say, what about all the misspelled words and what about all the mistranslated uh, verses. We need to get them to understand the full picture of exactly uh, what they've been taught and get them to research it so they can understand there's a lot more of a bigger picture here and what they've been directly taught is actually been set up for the mental enslavement and control of them and also their economics. Alright, so let me, um, let me just look at, at another culture here. The Jewish race has gone through atrocities for many, many centuries mm -hmm. and yet as a race of people they work together collectively they support one another, they work with each other, that Jewish dollar changes hands within eight times before it leaves the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Within the black community, one purchase, it leaves the black community. I think it, you know, statistics say it leaves the black community within an hour. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the Jewish culture, everywhere they go, they exceed, mm -hmm. and, and this DNA storage you're talking about with the black culture, uh, which keeps us separated and, and divided. We, we are consumers, we, we don't own, we don't produce. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between these two cultures? I believe the difference is that the slavery tactics and techniques that were utilized on African Americans uh, were so powerful and so detrimental that they put a very strong system in place that literally uh, had us demoralize ourselves and each other and put no value on anything of any value. Uh, the only thing that we have value on is what we can obtain for looks and for glamour to say that we made it out. Whereas in the Jewish community, they're taught pride, helping one another. You, you, you know, it's almost like the soldiers in the field, you know, leave no man behind type of a mindset. And they instill that in their children from youth. They're taught finances from youth. We're not teaching anything. I didn't learn how to help write a check and I went to high school, my high school didn't teach me how to write a check. I had to learn that on my own much later. So um, these are the things that are taught in the Jewish community from a very early age. Finances, how economics work, how interest works, how loans work, all these different aspects of culture, how to start your own business. It's put into them from the very beginning. Start a business. Find something you like to do and start a business. In the black community, it's go to work. Go to school, go to work, go to school, go to work. It's never start your own business, how to handle and manage your money. I remember, you know, looking back even at my parents when I was a youth, putting everything, all their money in a shoebox. Mm -hmm. There wasn't even a budget. I, I think one of the things, too, that we would have to put into a, a particular aspect, the Jewish race is taught, you are a minority, and here's how you survive being a Jew, mm -hmm. because they've had to do it for, for all these centuries. Mm -hmm. They know they're a minority. They know that there are certain cultures that will always hate on them and, and uh, won't cooperate with them, mm -hmm. so therefore they have to be self-sufficient anyway. Mm -hmm. We're not really taught you're a minority. Right. We're not taught, you know, you, you've got to really do this and this and this to succeed. Mm -hmm. We want everybody to love us. We want to always mm -hmm. just fit in. How do you expect people that hate themselves to love you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not about love it, yeah. it's, uh, and everybody loving you. It's about how do you go out and create your own, mm -hmm. own your own, and, and have some type of power, control, and ownership here. Exactly. I think that we need to start really educating our kids from a very early age and stop letting the system educate them. The system has uh, been very detrimental to the black community because even when they go to school, I remember going to school myself, it was almost like going to prison. And when you read and research prison or look at prison documentaries and then you go back, oh my God, the school, the system was set up almost the same exact way, especially in the inner cities. I remember going through gun detectors to go into school. I mean, this was just like, <laughs> you know, a prison sentence. Uh, and it's institutionalized, institutionalizing the children. And I think that uh, because a lot of the parents weren't educated on a lot of these things about finances, uh, how to excel, how to start your own business, uh, and also the fact that we've been uh, oppressed with getting loans, which is usually needed a lot of times to excel in business, uh, it really put us in boxes in. Not to mention the fact that they 
put the majority of the inner city people into these very small units, these, these project units, which then has everybody right on top of each other. And so now you have no money, you have this horrible uh, institutional system that's mentally and financially enslaving everybody and all the tension building up, then you add the drugs on top and now you've got an explosive situation. Uh, very explosive and, and very, <laughs> so many people have no hope yeah. and, and, and no direction. We talked about prisons a little bit. Um, let's talk about the prison system. Mm -hmm. Out of all the uh, Western civilizations, we have more individuals in prison than all the other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of those in prison are minorities, and mm -hmm. now prisons are really not so much to rehabilitate as they're privatized, and they're there for profit, mm -hmm. uh, not to rehabilitate. Talk about that. Yeah, prisons are definitely a profit center now. Uh, and the thing that's really sad about it, if you start looking at some of these private prisons and looking at who's on the board of directors, you discover that a lot of these uh, politicians are on the board of directors or behind the scenes funding or involved in some financial way into these prison systems. And that is very bad. Uh, there was a judge recently, I think it was three years ago, that got, finally got caught, probably because he didn't pay somebody off, uh, sending hundreds of underage children into prison for profits, obviously. He was getting paid under the table. When you look into the prison system and you look at the slippers that they got to put on, the clothing that they put on, these are all private industries now, the mattress that they sleep on, all the food that they're eating, it just starts adding up. When you look at the amount of people per capita that we have arrested or, or locked up in prison, you start to see that it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. Not, not million, not billion, but trillion dollar industry. So they are incentivized uh, to give cops quotas, to make them get a certain amount of people into the system, to get to, to drive that and fund that whole uh, financial aspect of the prison system, as it really has been now just turned into this big money-making scam. A lot of the people that are locked up are minorities, and 40% of the minorities that are locked up are in there on uh, victimless crimes. In other words, they didn't injure or hurt or rob anybody, they only hurt themselves. I was, our ministry does a lot of work with, with prisoners, and I was talking to one young man, and he and his cousin were sent to prison. He got five years, but his cousin had had an infraction before, so his cousin got 15 years. They stole fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars so he was in prison for one year for every thousand dollars that he stole mm -hmm. and yet he was pointing out a white counterpart that they knew who embezzled mm -hmm. uh, over two million dollars and he got a year and a half mm -hmm. for, for embezzlement so th there's such a big difference between the quote white collar crime mm -hmm. and uh, what the uh, minority young men and women go through Absolutely. I mean, if you just look at the amount of minorities that are arrested right now for multiple years off of uh, marijuana, which is a plant that grows in the ground, which is now being legalized all over the country, step by step, and these people are still doing time, and the private industry, prison industry is still making money off of these, these young men, uh, and they should be all released. Billy, let's go down a different road now. Mm -hmm. The revival of African-American spiritualism. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? There's a lot of movements right now, uh, pro-African, pan-African movements to get back into the African spirituality. A lot of uh, African-Americans are, you know, kind of tired of the religious system and they're looking to go back to the roots to see what may be there for them. They're looking for something different because if you look at um, overall the religious systems that are, have been in place, trillions and trillions of prayers have gone up, but there hasn't been truly not that many results. And I have a theory why there hasn't been that many results, but, but they've now gone into this, um, this African spirituality and they're trying to find ways to tap back into uh, what they may have missed uh, from their ancestors. Uh, the unfortunate thing about this is a lot of the information isn't do well documented, so it's, it's like getting handed down you know, from mouth to mouth. And you already know, if I've got 100 people on up in a room and I whisper in one person's ear, by the time it gets to the end, it's totally different. So there's a lot of flaws in what's being taught. Um, you know, even things like black people are the only people that have melanin, which is actually not true. Every human being has melanin or you wouldn't have skin. Mm -hmm. uh, the only difference is, is the color of the melanin. Um, you know, little things like that, but it adds up to big things. 
uh, and I wish there were, were a way to get real documentation so that people can learn the, the true aspect of the uh, you know, of the spirituality. But it's been slightly twisted again, unfortunately, some of the people who are putting it in place, twisting it for their own control and power or for their own fame or whatever you want to call it, but it's not exactly the way it should be. Now you've virtually traveled all around the world. How many countries have you been to? I've been in now about 20 countries. Okay, you've been to 20 countries. You're a researcher, you're a scientist. And I'm saying this because in having conversations with you, I know that you have put a lot of time, many, many years, into study and research and, and um, just really digging to look for your aspect of truth. Mm -hmm. So as far as the pulse beat of the African-American culture mm -hmm. when it comes to extraterrestrials, yeah. where do you feel this culture is at this particular time? Uh, totally asleep. Totally in complete denial uh, that anything exists outside of us. And the reason why is, unfortunately, it's the way that the, we, were, we had the Christianity beat into us. Anything you would think or talk about outside of whatever was told you in a few small verses was demonic and evil, and you were beaten and everything else for it. And that has traveled down the genetic lines to this current day, where as soon as you talk about meditation to African American community, as soon as you talk about spirituality and direct connection with God, bypassing uh, pastors and things like that, and being able to have a direct connection with Source, it's demonic and evil. Uh, you talk about astral projection, it's, oh, the demons are going to fill in your body. I mean, it's, everything is turned into, it's demon, demon, it's demon. Uh, and so, unfortunately, that's, you know, been the case when it comes to extraterrestrials. They can't seem to want to believe that um, there's anything outside of this planet. And most of them, uh, unfortunately, even start now to believe that the planet is flat. <laughs> Do you really think, I know some of the basketball yeah. players, Kyrie and others, yeah. have said that, but I always thought they were just joking. <laughs> they were dead serious. <laughs> This is one of the biggest CIA psyops in history. This conquer and divide tactic about the shape of the planet directly into the conscious community when it's expanding and exploding at its biggest time to create another what? Conquer and divide tactic between people who uh, believe that the earth is one shape versus another and it's become uh, this crazy fanatic thing and, and unfortunately it's really infiltrated the minorities the most. This is what I've seen. Now, of course, I have my own personal opinion, but I want to hear your perspective. Are <clears throat> extraterrestrials demonic? Uh, that's a good question. Now, we have yin and we have yang. It permeates the entire universe. Uh, I believe that you can't have good without bad and bad without good. You can't have day without night. Um, so there are good extraterrestrials and there are bad extraterrestrials. Some, would have, good, some have good intentions, some have bad intentions. When you look at the stories in the, uh, in the, uh, the epic of the Anunnaki, when you're looking at the Sumerian tablets, Enki and Enlil were brothers. Enki loved humans, even took a human wife. Enlil despised humans and killed them and slaughtered them and everything else. Uh, destroyed the Tower of Babel and everything. Uh, and he was the evil one. He actually then tried to blame his brother for being the evil one, but truthfully, he was the one that was evil. And in some of the ancient records, he's called Satan, the Lord of Eden. Okay, so... Once again, some people listening to this is okay. Wait a minute. This is this is really too far. So, Inky and and his brother, mm -hmm. if one wanted to do their own research, where where would you advise them to go? You can go to the JewishLibrary.org because they document Enlil, Enki, and Marduk very well there. A lot of people don't even realize that they're talked about in the Torah and so forth. You can go to the UCLA CDLI Cuneiform Online Library and you can get the Sumerian tablets directly off the virtual shelf and drop them into a translator and read the Sumerian uh, tablets for yourself. Uh, you can also read the uh, Emerald Tablets of Thoth, uh, the Book of Hermes. There's a lot of material out there that you can look at and read to discover you know, the, the truth about our ancient past and where the majority of the Book of Genesis was copied from. It was copied from the Enuma Elish, the Epic of the Atraeses, the Sumerian tablets, uh, the uh, Emerald Tablets of Thoth, uh, and the, the, third, the 42 Laws of Matt. So for those that don't believe in the Sumerian Tablets, how would you prove that they're authentic? Well, number one, they're written in cuneiform. And if you don't know what cuneiform is, look it up on YouTube and you can see the, the director of the British Library actually doing a demonstration of how it works. 
you have to take clay <clears throat> when it's soft and then you have to take this stylus and etch into it and it takes a very long time just to write one word so then you bake it so we're not talking about people sitting around 10,000 years ago going you know what I'd like to make up some stories <laughs> these people were writing about information that was very important and crucial to their society and usually these cuneiform tablets were written by scribes and dictated by a king or a lord so this is very important well documented information and when you study them you start to realize that this is identically what's now been copied into the modern day bible in some aspect not all of it just some of the some of the book of genesis and uh exodus and some of these other books you go you scratch your head wait a minute this was written in 100 to 900 a.d the bible and then these Sumerian tablets are seven to ten thousand years old the emerald tablets 36 thousand years old which came first the chicken or the egg uh, you know, so uh, there's a big discrepancy here, but a lot of this information came from these tablets. That's why I tell everybody, please go research these tablets, research this ancient information and find out where these texts came from. Research the Sinai Bible, which has 14,000 differences from the King James Version of the Bible. Research Aramaic and see which words and verses were mistranslated in the modern day Bible so you can get a better understanding of what you're basing your eternity on. Were blacks depicted in the Sumerian text? Yes, they were. They were called the black-faced people. Uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it was the black people <clears throat> that were Noah's uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, so you have them being depicted there. And uh, the only thing that separates some of the people from the black people were the fact that when these Anunnaki made it with some of the humans, the babies would come out like mulatto color. And they would have lighter eyes and red hair or blonde hair. All right. So before mating with mm -hmm. extraterrestrials, mm -hmm. if, if, if that's what you're saying, the blacks were depicted in the Sumerian writings uh, at, in, in what ways? They were called the black-faced people. They were the citizens, the majority of the slave workers that would mine, you know, handle the mines and the mining of the resources. And what part of the world was this in? That's in Africa. Okay. And these mines have been discovered. It's called Adam's Calendar, 200,000-year-old gold mines discovered exactly where the tablets say they were and the house that Enlil ruled from over these people was discovered there as well. So the, you know, the side walls and everything still standing. There's a verse that says the truth shall set you free. What role would you like to see the black population get into when it comes to full disclosure? And by full disclosure mm -hmm. I'm not talking about just the fact of whether there's extraterrestrials or not. I'm talking about the t suppressed technology, I'm talking about uh, all the other things that hold human beings down yeah. on, on this planet. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest that the black community do? The first thing that they have to do is they have to unlearn what they've learned. We need to do a complete cleansing of our mind and start from zero. And we need to start with heavy research and investigation. To date I've read over a thousand books. I've read everything. I want all the information so I could paint my own picture. And I think that uh, a race of people that's basing their whole life and their whole eternity off of one book is a detriment to, to their own society and to themselves. You can't rely on this one book, which is plagiarized information, some of it, not all of it, from multiple different sources <clears throat> to be your only one source of information that you're going to guide your family, guide your future, guide everything from. I think that we all need to unlearn and relearn by studying and researching to find out source material. Then also what we need to do is we need to then uh, uh, you know, find a way to take a journey of inner space. We need to find ourselves, love ourselves. We have to go inside <clears throat> and find the inner love, self-love, because we'll never truly be able to have unconditional love for anything on the outside if we don't have it for ourselves on the inside. And that's what the biggest part of what we're missing right now is that unconditional love for ourselves. We treat our own selves horrible. We destroy our own selves, we self-sabotage our own selves, and then that then leaks on the outside into the community, and you can see the evidence of it when you go into most, most of these poor communities. I agree with you, but what are some of the ways that, that you see that we're self-sabotaging and self-destructing? Self-sabotaging would be living paycheck to paycheck, not saving any money whatsoever, buying the freshest new pair of shoes, getting the newest car, trying to keep up with the Joneses, show off for the Joneses, when you should be in maybe investing that money if you really can't afford it. If you can afford it, that's fine, and you can still save, but if you can't save and, and you can't uh, provide for your family, why are you getting these things? If, and if you can't own something. If you can't own something, very, very important. Everything we've been doing is just literally throwing the money out and nothing's coming back in. 
honoring yourself even with the foods that you eat and don't eat. Exactly. One of the biggest problems we have right now is, you know, you hear the term black don't crack. Well, maybe black doesn't crack, but guess what? Our, our counterparts live a lot longer than us if you look at the historical record in the documents. So maybe they don't look as young as us for as long, but they live longer. Uh, you know, so what is this telling you? It's telling you that we're being poisoned. The soul food that we're eating is not really good for the soul. Uh, we need to change our diets. We're eating a lot of these GMOs, fast food restaurants, majority of it, and still the slave diet of this soul food. It was the slave diet was the food that was left over, the slop, the parts of the food, meats and everything else. Yeah, that the inner part of the hog. Exactly, all that bad stuff, you know, and the trailings and all this other stuff. And, and we're still eating it to this very day. Meanwhile, when you look at the, what the, the what the impact has had on us on our health. Oh, the high blood pressure, diabetes. The cholesterol, diabetes, oh. and the overweight yes. that is permeating through our society. Killers. And we're not making it to seventy. I mean, I've got friends from high school. It's unfortunate. Even a couple of us that are still around, we say that we're the last of the Mohicans because everybody else is either locked up or dead. And they're dead usually from health diseases because they're not old enough to die from natural causes. Billy, is it possible that Jesus was a black man? Oh, very possible. Uh, the person that's being depicted as Jesus everywhere is actually Caesar Borgia, who was the son of a pope, who actually killed his brother trying to get to the next level to become another you, pope. You, you're talking about the European picture? The European with picture the, of the, Jesus. With the beard and... Oh. Yeah. That's not and a real the long curly, and the long curly hair. That's yes. not a real depiction of a of an Arab person living in in the desert. Uh, most likely an Arab. I've been to you know uh, over there. You look around, you see mostly black people or people with extremely brown skin, uh, kinky and curly hair. In the Bible, there's a couple of verses that allude to the fact that Jesus' skin was the color of bronze. Um, was he a real person? Is a big question a lot of the times. Well, Jesus was a very real person. Now, his name wasn't Jesus. His name was Yeshua. And I've been to the house where he lived in Egypt when he left to go to Egypt with his mother. That house is now like a shrine. It's in Coptic Egypt, Coptic Cairo, I'm sorry. And it's inside of a Coptic church now uh, because the churches have been around long before Christianity. But anyway, so he went there. And if you read the uh, Gospel of the Holy Twelve, you discover where he was from the time he disappeared from the Gospels at the age of 14 to 33. He was in Egypt learning the mysteries of 14 the to 30. 14 to 30. I'm sorry, yes. And he was learning the, um, the, the Egyptian mysteries. He went to Tibet to learn mystic arts and uh, also to India to learn Reiki healing. So this is all in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, uh, which is a book that I recently just finally acquired. I had only been looking at some of the other versions of it, but I finally acquired an actual real original copy, which, um, which is good. Uh, so, but he's a real person. Most likely was a, um, a minority, uh, you know, probably a darker person. Uh, if you look at the people in the region, it's common sense. and. Um, he truly did exist. It wasn't a, a, a fabricated person. It's been documented that uh, the Sumerian texts outdate the, uh, the Torah. What similarities, though, are in the Sumerian texts and in what was now referred mm -hmm. to as the Torah or the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. A lot of the similarities would be um, like Genesis 6, the, the sons of God, many with the daughters of men. Um, the ages that people were living to back then are also very similar. Uh, people were living much longer. I'm talking about Homo sapiens like us mm -hmm. living much longer than we're living right now. Uh, and also uh, the Tower of Babel incident where Yahweh, who in the Sumerian epic is Enlil, the, the bad brother, and in the Torah you're talking about um, uh, Yahweh, uh, who's coming back, or God who's coming back. Um, and very interesting thing is um, a person that is, or entity that's a creator of a universe, who then sees people working together on one accord to, 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 to uh, achieve a goal, most likely wouldn't then destroy that object of their goal uh, and, and then disband the people and say one very crucial thing. My seed should not abide in man forever, his years should be 120. Now that's both stated, that's stated in both records. And what happened is, in, in, at Harvard University, they discovered that because of this chromosome to chromosome uh, connection, this chromosome two uh, fusion uh, with telomeres on each cap, on each end, we can only live to about 120 years under the most pristine conditions. So now, real science is backing up what the ancient tablets and texts have said. So I find that very interesting that um, that this uh, interaction happened back then, and this entity, this being, 
ordered some type of a modification and scientists are saying this thing is very old this modification is not a natural evolution process but we can't figure out who did it and when they did it i was going to ask why was it pre-flood that quote humans lived such a longer time compared to modern day man well what happened was the our ancestors who were most likely our cousins i don't think they were homo sapiens yet um, we don't know exactly how long they lived it was the kings that were talked about and these people who came here who documented themselves very well uh, were living for tens of thousands of years now when they after the flood they genetically um, uh, enhanced the, the hominid and created the homo sapien I don't know if you want to call it enhanced because to me I believe that they disconnected us from a lot of our, our resources our DNA has been now junk DNA our pineal glands have shrunk down our, and our, our in tuneness with spirituality has been significantly weakened, our spiritual antenna. Um, but when that happened, uh, the initial ones that were here were living for 800, 900,000 years. Uh, after the Tower of Babel incident is when Enlil or Yahweh decided to cut that time down that we were living to him because we were living so long, we were able to communicate, we were able to come up with ideas, and he realized that if we can live that long, we can come to a realization of, uh, of what we are and cut and set a goal, we can achieve it, and they, we outnumbered them. So that's when they realized, I've got to cut these years down, they're living too long. We're about at the end of our interview, and it's been fascinating. I want to give you time to look into your camera and just share with your audience what you would like them to do to get to the next step in their own evolution. Well, one thing that I'd like to see people do, especially in the black community, is to start to research and investigate everything they've been taught. I don't expect you all to believe in aliens and all this other kind of stuff. Some of you will, some of you won't. And that's okay. There's no problem with that. What I do want you to do is I want you to analyze everything that you've been taught from the time you were born. Go and research it, but don't just research it from a couple of Google searches. Go and get books. Research the source material. Resource, research the source words and terminologies. Find out more about real science. Research basic standard physics. Start learning basic biology and how things work. And stop taking information that's been handed down from one person to the next and taking it as true. You've got to answer your own questions. You've got to dig deeper. You've got to spend a lot more time. It's very important that you do this so you can get the truth. Also, change your diet. I don't expect everybody to become a vegan, but you can significantly modify your diet to a point where you can uh, make yourself healthier and you can also pass it on to your children because we've been now been killing ourselves with food and bad information for hundreds of years. We need to change that. We need to convert. There needs to be a change made right now where we all start to rethink the way everything is processed and we need to change our diets and go out there and just try to live a better life and also tap into finances. Learn how finances work. Learn how credit works. Uh, teach your kids from an early age how to start businesses. Make that their goal, not just to go to school and get a good job and then pay taxes, but to actually excel to another level, to be their own boss and to keep the dollar circulating in your community. Thank you so much, Billy. Uh, I think he said it all. I, I think you should also start to modify your gates, what you listen to, what you watch, what you allow to permeate your spirit. Uh, analyze who is really trying to motivate you, uh, download into you, what is trying to download into you. You've got to learn to be more sensitive to what's, to what's going on, who's trying to pull your strings, who, who is the puppeteer. And one of the most important aspects, learn to love yourself and then love on others. You are watching Forbidden Knowledge TV.